Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get us started uh, so that we can get to hear from all of our awesome panelists today. Um, so I am going, my name is Holly Mayton. I'm the Director of Partnerships at the National Science Policy Network and also an incoming AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellow in the State Department Office of Agriculture Policy. And I am super excited to have been asked to moderate this panel. Uh, big thanks to Chris Unterberger who put together all of this uh, in the background. So thanks so much. Um, and I am just, I'm excited to have all of these great panelists to talk about our subject today, which is racial inequities in food systems and agriculture training. Uh, and I'm really excited to see this really span the range of food system from consumer to agriculture to grower uh, and everything in between. And so I think we can have a lot of great conversation and I encourage all of our attendees to drop questions in the Q&A anytime. Um, but I am gonna briefly introduce all three of our panelists quickly and then give each of them a few minutes to present a little about their work and what they're passionate about. And then I've got some questions for them, but we can open up to the, to the audience Q&A anytime. So first I wanna introduce Luis Rodriguez Cruz. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in, foods, in the Food Systems Program and the Gund Institute for the Environment at the University of Vermont, where he studies the role of governance structures and decision-making uh, and our food systems vulnerability to natural hazards. And I wanted to also note that he's the co-chair of the Puerto Rico Science Policy Action Network, which is one of NSPN's flagship chapters. So thank you so much for being here, Louise. Up next, we'll have Dr. Bol Olga Bolden Tiller. Uh, she is the national president elect of Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources and Related Sciences or MANNERS, as well as a professor, department head and assistant dean at Tuskegee University. Uh, and you can read her bio on our website, but I'll just say that she is really a decorated leader and mentor in supporting early career students and professionals in the food and agricultural fields. And so thank you so much for being here, Dr. Bolden Tiller. And then third, we'll have Sarah Wong. She is an advocate for farmer rights and food justice and immigrant communities writ large. She's currently serving as a program manager at the New England Grassroots Environment Fund, uh, as well as a, a PhD candidate wrapping up, I think next month, uh, in cultural anthropology with concentrations in applied anthropology and ecological sciences and engineering from Purdue University. So thank you so much to all three of our panelists for being here today. I'm gonna stop my screen share and pass it over to Louise to kick us off. Thank you so much, Holly, for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? I'm gonna start the timer. <laughs> So hi everybody, buenas tardes from Puerto Rico, where I am. So happy and grateful and excited to be here with all of you. I study the human component in, in our food systems and I depart from the premise that people, we people are embedded in social ecological systems in which there are power and governance structures and dynamics that have an effect on our adaptive capacity, meaning those uh, abilities and resources we have access to, to prepare for, cope with, withstand, uh, resist, respond, and recover from the impacts of natural hazards. And I strive to understand what are the role of those dynamics around adaptive capacity. And I wanna take this minute uh, from my positionality as a student and incipient researcher to share with you some of my efforts around research, science communication, and advocacy uh, to give visibility to these issues. My work focuses in the Caribbean, and we know that from the Bahamas to Bonaire, Curacao, and Aruba, these islands do not produce a significant amount of global greenhouse gas emissions. Nevertheless, they are disproportionately affected by climate change related events, not only extreme weather events, but also sea level rise, coral pollution, and, and other factors. And, in this changing climate, in this reality of compounded impacts, we know that food security is frail across these islands. Uh, and such, it's important to understand how can we strengthen local food systems in a way that they provide the food that we need in a way that is sustainable, just, and equitable. And my research centers on a key element of these food systems, and those are farmers and fisher folks who are not only key agents in producing the food that nourishes us, but also in safeguarding the natural resources that sustain us. So I'm looking at adaptive capacity uh, amongst farmers in the Caribbean and taking into account that it doesn't, that adaptive capacity does not lie solely on the individual, that these people and all of us are embedded 
in systems where there are power and governance structures and dynamics, not only at the global at the local level, but also at the globalized scale too. So in my research, I'm trying to bring more understanding to the interplay and the feedback loops between these dynamics, looking at farmers adaptive capacity in Puerto Rico and adapt farmers adaptive capacity in the context of the agricultural recovery after the impact of Hurricane Maria, which was a category five hurricane that made landfall in Puerto Rico in 2017, which decimated 80% of Puerto Rico's agriculture uh, in, a, in a moment where agriculture in Puerto Rico was seeing uh, an, uh, an improvement. And this was very important given that Puerto Rico produces between 10 to 15% of the uh, the food that it consumes, if of the food that it consumes. So after the hurricane, alongside the extension service of the University of Puerto Rico, we surveyed 405 farmers across the islands on different aspects of that recovery process, not only their access to food, uh, impacts on their livelihoods, but also obstacles towards recovery and perceptions around risk, climate change, and policy as well. And I'm right now in the process of deeply in analyzing that data with Meredith Niles at the University of Vermont, and you all can have access to the public report on the descriptive uh, results that we already have shared with many farm organizations and extension as well. And I want to share with you some key points around policy that came up from that survey, and almost half of farmers think that Puerto Rico does not have the necessary policies to protect and support local agriculture. So what are the policies that are needed what are the ways that we need to transform the governance within our food systems to make it more just and equitable, but also that provides better adaptive capacity outcomes uh, in this changing climate. 5% uh, of those farmers support the Jones Act. And I bring this as, a, as an example to think about how external forces have an, uh, a play a role in Caribbean food systems. So Puerto Rico is a, an uncorporated territory of the United States, and these farmers are American, American citizens. And, but they don't have agency to a great extent on many federal regulations and policies, such as the Jones Act, on the impact of local food systems. And almost half of them reported that one of their main obstacles towards recovery were government-related obstacles. So many of these farmers are required to have agricultural insurance for the Department of Agriculture, but they had to wait three to five months to get these insurance payments. And they are also part of some programs that to some extent do, do not match with the current reality in Puerto Rico and that may be to some extent creating barriers for them to adapt sustainable or agroecological practice. So what are, so I'm be, I've been thinking about what, how to, those policies can match the current reality. And also going a little forward for right now within the pandemic, this is something that I wrote for Puerto Rico Senor Bolivia. When in the start of the pandemic, the, go the government of Puerto Rico started doing closures to control COVID and I raised, uh, tried to bring awareness on how these executive orders were not taking into account how within our local food system, Puerto Rican farmers are very dependent on non-conventional markets, meaning that they sell to Plaza del Mercado, farmers market and other venues not only through supermarkets. And furthermore, these farmers, though American citizens, they have to wait two to three months to be part of the USDA coronavirus uh, food assistance program, because many of these programs are, are not aligned with the type of production in Puerto Rico, such as uh, tropical products, for example. So beyond the, the academic or the research scope, I've been working with the Puerto Rico Science Policy Action Network to bring visibility to these issues and bring them to the public discussion. Peer's plan is an initiative from Ciencia Puerto Rico, which brings Puerto Rican scientists and allow them to build their skill sets to engage in science communication and policy. And I wanna share a few examples of how we have brought visibility uh, to these issues. Uh, we, this is uh, my colleague and co-chair, Bianca Valdez, and we partnered with Mente Abierta Podcast, where during this election cycle, many candidates were interviewed and they were asked about their opinions on food security, on various farmers and fisher folks are facing. And this is a subject that sadly is very overlooked in Puerto Rico. We also were one of the organizations that collaborated with the Debate Ambiental, which brought the gubernatorial candidates to talk about food sovereignty, emergency, just emergency management, and other topics. 
We also, through Science Vising, uh, we did a series of webinars where we brought these issues to the public discussion. Here is an example of when we brought Alma Cartagena to talk about food sovereignty and agricultural education. And we also have worked with scientists that do work on intersecting agriculture and policy to bring their work into the public discussion. So though as students, we may have different barriers and limitations to bring uh, awareness and visibility to issues around equity and justice in our food systems, certainly we can leverage our networks to, to do our part and start bringing that visibility and looking forward to keep the conversation with all of you. And these are my, my contacts if you wanna reach out. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Louise. That was great to see really the, the breadth of both research and the kind of scholar activism that we've talked about in the context of food systems. So thank you. Uh, up thank next, you we have Dr. Olga Bolden-Tiller. Give her uh, introductory remarks. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers for having me. So I'm very excited to speak on the topic of racial inequities in food systems and agriculture training today. I have a unique perspective, I would say, because I am at Tuskegee University, which is one of the thought leaders in terms of this topic. And we have a large number of faculty members, um, both current and past, who have really delved into this area. And I've had the opportunity to learn from these individuals over the years, and I'm very excited to continue to learn and very excited to see that this topic is increasing in terms of its notability and that it is being discussed in venues such as this. We know that underrepresented groups in agriculture persist. We look at minority representation in agriculture across the board, not only African-Americans, but other minority groups as well. Here at Tuskegee University, we work very closely in the Alabama Black Belt with limited resource producers, particularly those and including those that are um, of minority descent. And we work very hard to incorporate into our research programs a very integrative approach that allows for the training of students that are here at our institution. In fact, just recently in the past three years, we started an integrative public policy and development program that specifically looks at a lot of these different issues related to minority farmers. And we wanted to incorporate not just understanding what the issues were, but really training individuals so that they would have the knowledge base and foundation to not only understand what the challenges are, but more importantly, to have the tools to understand how to effect policy, because that is what is key. We know that a lot of the challenges that we have and that we see that persist are a result of policy issues. Here we have a cover of the Minority Landowner magazine. Oftentimes minorities in agriculture don't get their due in terms of visibility. Um, the owner of this magazine actually is a Tuskegee University graduate. And so we're very excited as an institution to continue to infuse the importance of individuals working in this area and making this area visible. There, have been an in, there has been an increase in the number of black farmers in America. From 2012 to 2017, we saw a 2% increase and that's still not a lot. When you think about it, it sounds exciting that there is an increase. However, only about 45,000 black farmers exist in the United States. 95% of farmers in the United States are actually white farmers. When we look to the disparities that we see in this field, we find two major issues. 
One of them is access to programs. And the United States has a lot of programs to support farmers. However, it is not equitable. And as such, minority farmers have suffered by not having access to these opportunities. Secondly, equity and funding of the programs that address issues that are specific to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, including minority farmers, black farmers, et cetera. So where there are programs that are specific to these individuals, the funding in those programs are so low that they're not very impactful. And this brings us to a perfect example. Many of you may have heard of Shirley Sherrod. She's a former Georgia State Director of the Rural Development for the USDA. But also, she grew up on a farm. She had a family farm. They were very, very successful in terms of farming. She went to land grant institutions, including the Fort Valley State University before completing her degree and going on for a master's. And based on her experiences as a youth, what she learned at land grant institutions such as Fort Valley, she decided that she wanted to pursue a career in agriculture. She knew how important it was that she understand the policies and how to keep land. And this was a result of her experiences as a child, whereby her father was murdered on their property during a dispute over cattle. And so even from a young child, she was adamant about wanting to pursue this type of career. She worked for the USDA, she had a successful career, up until a certain point when some words that she said were taken out of context and there was a big controversy and she ended up leaving the USDA, although she was later vindicated. But some of her other work included the establishment with her husband of the New Communities Land Trust. It was one of the largest tracts of land owned by minority producers, over 5,700 acres. And ultimately, when they sought assistance from the government through these different programs that exist, they were denied as a collective. And the land trust existed from 1969 to 85, but due to a lack of support and funding from being able to actually access existing governmental programs that they were knowledgeable of, the group ended up losing their land. Ultimately, there was a lawsuit and it was found that in fact, discrimination had taken place and they were later compensated. But this is just one example about land loss and challenges that are faced by minority farmers. So what's the outlook? What happens? What do we do? There are some good things that have been happening in recent years. One other challenge in addition to the two that I just mentioned is also with minority farmers, particularly in the Southeast, is the inability to break up land or sell land because it is what we refer to as heirs property. As we know, for many years, it was against the law for minorities to learn, be able to read or write or be able to say that they could, to be able to sign contracts. And this included will. How is it that you pass on land from one generation to the next? Part of it is through wills. And without that results, we've had the result whereby the group of heirs then are allocated the property. In the Southeast particularly, there is such a huge problem with the inability for agreement to take place so that these lands can be utilized or sold and what have you. And so heirs property is a major issue. The 2018 Farm Bill put forth $10 million or proposed $10 million that would allow for loan projects for the relending to assist these heirs so that they could actually divide up ownership without 
these issues. And we see a lot of this in the Southeast, particularly with large tracts of land that have previously been used for farming. And so this is a major, major issue. Unfortunately, again, these types of programs that are specifically targeting people who are socially disadvantaged are not well funded, although they did give them $10 million. However, the release of these funds has been very, very slow. So in fact, it is only now over two years later that we see the initiation of some of this work being done. The 2501 program is another USDA funded program. It provides federal grants specifically to assist organizations that work with farmers of color, as well as military veterans in owning and operating farms. The grants can be used to help historically underrepresented farmers directly access other USDA programs and it's administered by the OPPE. However, this program, though very powerful, is very underfunded when we look at the number of individuals who indeed need assistance. So what's next? What do we do? Education is certainly the key. I am an educator as indicated, and so I do believe in the power of education. We have a tremendous number of land-grant institutions throughout the country, both at historically both at our historically black universities, but also our predominantly white institutions. And these institutions have in their power, particularly working with organizations such as Manners that have in mind the specific needs of minority farmers. And as such, it's very important that these schools are also supported in the work that they do so that they can train and educate individuals who are aware of these different issues that we have and so that they can also be trained to not only identify and reach them, but more importantly, effect change through policy. And that is my time. And so I will give off to the next presenter. Thank you. Look forward to the additional discussion in our next set. Thanks so much, Dr. Boldentiller. That was great to hear some really tangible examples of policy you know, in the US that we could dig into a little bit after. And there is one question in the chat, but I'm gonna save it for all the panelists to answer it after. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks to all the panelists. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, and I think that there's a lot of um, shared pieces and kind of what I'll be talking about as well. Um, so today I will mostly be talking about kind of thinking about our food systems and us as consumers, but also as community members. And so a lot of this work that I'll be referring to comes out of my master's work at Purdue, where this work was fully grounded in understanding the intersections of food, race, and policy. Um, for some context behind the work, I worked with a local food policy council, university extension office, and immigrant and refugee folks that were engaged at a community garden to market program. And all of this work took place in Anchorage, Alaska. However, while this might seem very far away to a lot of people, um, I hope to emphasize that this work broadly applies to how we think about urban food systems across the United States. Um, so currently we see, especially during pandemic times, there's a growing need for access to food. We see grassroots organizers implementing garden to home programs to feed that need. Um, and we also see a growing rise in mutual aid and community resourcing of food within neighborhoods. And so you can kind of start to see how a lot of these um, food systems kind of take place within different scales, right? So we see these urban food systems, we see this happening within you know, our own communities, but we also see this happening within our neighborhoods. So what I wanna focus on today is kind of looking at this street level um, scale. So what do we see when we walk through our neighborhoods, our cities or our communities? Um, what does that food system look like? We often see gardens, we see community gardens, we see garden boxes in our neighbor's yards. Um, this box in particular um, on the top left-hand side of the screen shows um, food that's grown outside of a Korean grocery store. So we also see 
um, restaurants and marketplaces. Um, pictured here, we see a Dominican restaurant next to an Asian grocery store. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner, we see a Sudanese food truck. And so we, when we look at this food system that's pictured here, we can ask ourselves, how are these represented within food policy, particularly urban food policy? And if they are, how are they showing up? How are these stories and how are these people showing up? So we have to start from the premise that folks exist outside of these policies and that always happens. Um, but we also see how folks like immigrants and refugee communities are nominally represented, meaning that we see them when we want to. For example, this refugee food program that brings food from a garden to the market. These are the stories that we often remember when we want to feel good about our food system, right? Because it shows these ideas of representation and diversity. However, there's stories that happen within this bigger one. So for example, how are these farmers supported within their city? Some of these farmers that participate in this garden to market program, they want to expand outside of this program. They wanna grow their own food to consume in their families. They want to also expand this entrepreneurial opportunity to help financially support their families, meaning that they want to have their own stands at farmer's markets. But in order to do so, and this is kind of what Dr. Bolden Tiller was talking about, where there are gaps in how farmers can get access to land. Um, this is true in urban areas, especially where there is very minimal land for growing. And so that's something that happens with these farmers. They need access to land for garden plots. They need access to reliable public transportation that brings them from their garden plots to the market. So we're thinking about in Alaska, particularly a reliance on bus systems. Um, but then we're also thinking about, um, you know, how they can get access to these farmers markets, right? There's a cost um, to participate. And so these are only a few examples of the ways um, in which structural barriers are occurring for immigrant and refugee community members to be able to participate within food systems. Um, and oftentimes they're prohibiting, limiting, and inhibiting the growth of these immigrant and refugee food systems. And so oftentimes when we think about racial equity, um, within food policy, we often think about, you know, how can we bring people in? But what it really requires asking is what is happening within these communities and what are their needs and what are their wants um, for how they're imagining what a future food system looks like where they're fully incorporated rather than just being nominally represented. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. So great. Um, I was, I'm just so happy to see really all these different scales and categories of the food system represented amongst our, our panelists. Um, and with that in mind, I actually, if our panelists want to turn their video back on, hopefully we can treat this fairly conversationally, but I, I wanted to first ask one of the questions that we as a group had talked about when we touched base. And I'm reminded of as you all are talking about such different from Alaska to Puerto Rico to the Southeastern United States, we're really covering the range of, of people and places and um, kind of issues in the agricultural system. And so I'm curious from your all perspective, you know, as for the agricultural sustainability movement moves forward as we try to make policies that advance both sustainability and equity at the same time, is it even possible to create policies that are really good and beneficial for all of these different groups of people and communities and needs? Um, and if not, you know, what is the solution uh, at kind of national scale, the national scale? Um, I think, Holly, that you said it best when you said policies with an S. And I think that one of the challenges that we have seen for many years, um, even leading up to the 2501 program that was established, and it was established as the first one to directly target challenges faced by minority producers, is that for many years, the issues that minority farmers and limited resource producers had were never addressed. And so they only, they only primarily looked at the larger farms, the larger scale. And what we saw that resulted from that oftentimes was the closure 
or the encapsulation of these small farms to become a part of larger farms because it was no longer feasible. I mean, people can't feed themselves. We see some of these challenges in the past year with the dairy industry, for instance. So looking at limited resource or small farmers in general and addressing what their specific needs are and then respecting the differences when we look at minority farmers and how there are challenges as I mentioned previously about the establishment of wills, um, I remember not long ago, we did a collaborative project with Iowa State and we brought farmers from Iowa down to Alabama and took farmers from Alabama up to Iowa. And we were talking about data science and big data and things of that nature, but the term heirs property came up and one of the farmers from Iowa, he could not even fathom the, con the concept. And he was like, well, why didn't they do a will? And I said, as you recall, it was illegal for them to have wills. So I think we have to really take into consideration the needs of all of the different groups so that we can establish a multitude of policies. And we've seen some of that direction, but not enough, certainly. Yeah, I think that's a great overview thinking about um, farmers. And I, I just wanna chime in um, in terms of thinking about consumers on that side where um, you know, the research has shown, you know, that food deserts exist in urban areas and we're constantly just thinking about these big box grocery stores as the only suppliers of food to our communities. And we all know that that's not true, right? Like we often rely on our neighborhood stores, especially now in COVID times where, you know, people aren't about to get on public transportation and, you know, risk health um, risks. And so, you really are relying on just being able to walk down the street and go to your bodega or go to your, you know, we have a neighborhood grocery store here and that's just a lot more convenient. And so if we start to understand, you know, what are the resources and what are the community assets that are actually feeding people, then we can start to rely on just not understanding these like common dominant ideas of, you know, grocery stores are the only things that feed people, but actually start to look at what are the resources that people are already using and how can we start to implement that and strengthen that within our policies? I totally agree with that and echo what uh, the fellow panelists have said. Here in the context of Puerto Rico, I think thinking more when building these policies to do them in a way that is participatory, for example, a few years ago, two years ago, the incentives goes around agriculture change in Puerto Rico, and many of the farmers were against that. And there was a lot of criticism uh, around the lack of vita uh, publica, I, I, I don't the, the English uh, phrase case my mind, but you know, like they didn't bring those voices into the, into how that was going to be reformulated. So certainly I think keeping into account that it's like polycentric Government, government, government systems, and that all voices should be uh, brought in. And also, again, here in the context of Puerto Rico, I think, again, thinking about how these institutions respond to the to the context of compound impacts, and also like not to put everybody in the same basket. So I think one of the other criticisms around here in Puerto Rico is that things are very to some extent centralized and do not take into account the different aspects within Puerto Rico and the, the agricultural regions that are here. It's great to hear sort of the optimism from you all and solutions driven answers to that to that question. Uh, there's one more that we wrote down before we go to the audience questions that's related to this. A, a lot of the things you talked about around participatory policy making um, and having multiple policies to adapt to multiple different communities or, or groups or parts of the food system. I'm curious if you all have any, and people have shouted out a few in their presentations, but any specific successful policies or more broadly social change movements in kind of the equity and food systems space that you're most excited about and have seen be successful at accomplishing some of these things that you've mentioned at any scale? Here in Puerto Rico, one thing that has been successful is that uh, allocating part of the of NAP, the Nutrition Assistance Program in Puerto Rico, to be so that people can use use it in in farmers markets and what 
here we call mercados familiares in the different plazas around municipalities where local farmers that have limited access to supermarkets or that face some sort of, of competition with imports cannot have cannot get their products to uh, consumers that you know to to in order to sell your product and have like the, the debit little machine it it takes resources and not many farmers can have that so that that program here in puerto rico has been very successful in allowing farmers and people to have access to local foods And so I mentioned a couple like the 2501 um, grant program, which was outstanding. Um, although again, not, not funded as well as it needs to be to meet the need. Um, but some of the grassroots programs, I know here we have a Black Belt Community Coalition that helps supports producers to do some of the things like what Luis was talking about. Simple things like being able to accept EBT or SNAP payments, being able to um, take debit cards, things of that nature, being able to go online. We've seen some very, very great innovative work in the past few months during COVID, as Sarah indicated, that resulted out of innovation. You know, they said, you know, when you need something, innovation will come. And so a lot of these limited resource producers, they are used to feeding people. That's who they are, not just what they do. And so they are propelled to figure out how can I continue to do that? And so we saw a lot of innovation. We saw a lot of um, pop-up things online. Everybody became an online guru, store guru um, in the past month. And it's been very fascinating to see. Um, you would think that it would be a no-brainer. We have HelloFresh and Blue Apron, so obviously you can mail food. But, you know, to see limited resource producers, smaller farmers take on these different opportunities, really master them and be able to support not only themselves, but particularly their local communities so that they could help address a lot of the shortages that we've seen recently. And this is just a new wave of how business will be done in the future. This is a good new normal. Yeah, I really wanna echo that. I think a lot of the, the grassroots efforts that people have done in their own communities with mutual aid, redistribution of food within their neighborhoods. And I think a lot of that was definitely born out of the pandemic, but certainly exposes a lot of the in, um, inadequacies within our food system where we're really not supporting the community. And I think it's it's amazing to see kind of the grassroots efforts in, in being able to fill that need. Um, but I'm really interested in kind of the post period of what happens afterwards, right? We know that, you know, mutual aid is really calling on people to shift economies. We're calling on people to think outside of the extractive communities um, and economies and really just asking like, how can we redistribute? How can we kind of close this feedback loop? Um, and so I'm interested in what that, what that looks like afterwards. I mean, you know, how are communities gonna continue to feed themselves and, and how is government gonna respond to that? Those are all great points and great optimistic examples. Again, thank you all. Um, I'm going to switch us to a little more of a agricultural training focus that was part of this session as well. And this is a question I think some folks have answered in the written Q&A, but I wanted to bring up for everyone, um, which is, I'll just read this comment that was um, one of our attendees is really grateful to hear you mention agroecology and food sovereignty uh, as part of agricultural education systems. Do you all feel like that's uh, becoming more commonly taught or really on the edges of agricultural education in the U.S.? Um, and particularly they're curious because um, it seems on the fringe here to them, but in the Latin America that it's more common in the agricultural training. I think that the idea that students should have these global experiences has really opened the door for them to question what they see with regards to food systems and how food systems work differently abroad, particularly in developing countries. And because of that, I think that there has been almost a demand for the inclusion of answers to these questions, which brings forward 
the idea and concept of food sovereignty. And so I think that it's, it's relatively new in terms of its incorporation, but becoming increasingly mainstream as we see the incorporation of more global experiences for, for students particularly, as well as the creation and development of programs that students will complete after like AgriCorps and things of that nature, which also brings um, students into a new graduates into um, spaces where they can start to call these things into question. And so they're subsequently then going on for additional education, becoming thought leaders in these spaces and making this a part of the work that they do. Yeah, I, I answer, I echo what Dr. Ogobon Taylor says. I answered uh, Leah who made the question, but I think I didn't put it public, sorry, but uh, just gonna repeat what I answered to him in the context of Puerto Rico that I would say that is that uh, bringing our college and food sovereignty to classroom, it's at the edges in some schools in, in Puerto Rico and very integrated in others. I, I think I would say like the urban rural uh, components play a role in that, but there's certainly, um, I think it, we have seen it more after what happened with Hurricane Maria, which opened our eyes to many things that we have seen a strong collective of agricultural education teachers throughout Puerto Rico who are bringing these up agriculture and food sovereignty principles, which are very strong throughout uh, Latin America and bringing them to the classroom. So I think uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, I think it's, it's growing here. I think that's really great to hear on, on many levels. And maybe I'll ask this follow-up question in the chat as well. Um, following up on agricultural ecology specifically, um, we're curious about your all's perspective on how we maintain genetic diversity of niche foods or perhaps foods from cultures that are utilized by historically or currently marginalized communities as it seems that commodities tend to get largely the focus of our economic policies these days. I know that's a hard question for <laughs> you all to answer. I don't wanna put Sarah in the spotlight, but I think here we, we bring like the, the, the cultural components and also making aware that we live in a globalized world and also that in many places we are subject to this neocolonial or extractive practices. But uh, I, I, I think I don't have the, the, the knowledge to, to answer. That's a very hard question. <laughs> well, I, I would say that there are efforts to do this, even by people who promote genetically modified food. Um, when we look at the sector, some of the things that they are doing is getting a lot of what we call heirloom seeds and banking them so that we can have access to this genetic diversity. Even the most advanced thinker um, who is um, wanting to utilize biotechnology and incorporate biotechnology understands the significance of having genetic diversity. It's homologous recombination, and I'm a scientist, so sorry, at its best. And so without that, you don't get the heterogeneity, you don't get the hybrid vigor. And so it's critical even to scientists who are promoting um, genetic modifications that that genetic diversity be maintained. And so although we see a lot of promotion with regards to individuals being able to you know, utilize seed that is going to be, you know, kind of widespread the same seed, there are opportunities and there will, we have to remember that technology is ever changing. And it's not like you come up with the perfect seed and, and you leave it alone. It's ever changing. It's just like med medicines and treatments. It's just like the cell phone. We were very excited about that first box cell phone way back when, but I'm much happier with the iPhone now. You know, so we want to see change continue 
but the basic components have to be maintained and we have to be clear about all of the different aspects. So genetic diversity is important. I think that a lot of programs and projects are being established through grants and other things that are going um, worldwide to identify these heirloom um, commodities and heirloom seeds and such, and they are being banked for you know, future utilization so that we don't have homology because that will not be good as we know. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to hear because um, I, I think how I would answer it is that I feel like I see um, like seed distribution happening so frequently in communities in terms of, you know, maintaining some of the, you know, the foods that I'm thinking about my mom um, in Korea, you know, she brought, or, you know, there are seeds from Korea that we've grown in the U.S. that kind of get passed around, you know, between my family and other families. And, um, and just to be able to see that that that's happening within communities, whether, you know, it's legible or not. Um, but I think another thing that came to mind, Holly, when you were asking this question is just thinking about some of the, the cultural ownership of food um, in our system or in our food system in the U.S. in particular. Um, and I think that, you know, there have been a lot of things that are happening in kind of food media um, with Bon Appetit magazine um, that, you know, really calls out some of these tensions of racism, both within kind of the, the structures or the institutions of food media, um, but also in answering this question of who gets ownership of cultural foods. Um, you know, do they belong to the immigrant communities where they're born from or, you know, are other people in the US allowed to kind of co-opt them and change them and, you know, create these fusion dishes. And I think that that's really an interesting question to push, you know, kind of when we are thinking about racial justice is, you know, who, who has the ownership, right? We've been talking about who has ownership to the land, who has ownership of these seeds, you know, who has the ownership of food in general? Um, and so I think that's just something that I wanted to add that came to mind. I want to add, uh, listening to you both, uh, brought to, to my attention something that in Puerto Rico has been talked about after Hurricane Maria. It's like an after, uh, before and after the hurricane. Uh, uh, said that one of their main obstacles towards recovery after the hurricane was lack of seeds, that they didn't have seeds. So we started to think, like, where do they get these seeds? How the systems that we are working on produce the seeds that we need and, and looking at different practices that can provide us, you know, that we produce those seeds that, that we need, especially after uh, uh, a, a dire impact like Hurricane Maria. That's awesome. I'm gonna take us back to the policy side of things with another great question in the Q&A, uh, which is, Perhaps maybe Dr. Bolton Taylor, you could start us off, but um, a great question about how agricultural policy in the US might change if Representative David Scott is named the chair of the House Ag Committee, uh, or as has been um, circulated, potentially Representative Marsha Fudge as a candidate for Secretary of Agriculture, and kind of what is the significance and what could possibly change by having people in, of color in these leadership positions on the national policy scale for agriculture? Well, I think that that depends. Um, it's not, you know, it, it's it's not only the color of your skin, but the content of your heart, so to speak. And so I think that, you know, it's very important to understand not just um, that these individual minorities, what are their experiences with producers, both minority farmers, as well as large scale and commercial farmers. And so I think that that is what's important. I think that certainly um, they will feel a responsibility as they should to make certain that the voice of the minority farmer and hence limited resource farmers as well because they tend to have some of the same challenges irrespective of what their colors may be. Um, I think that the voice of the farmer may be heard a little bit more greatly. Um, and so I think that that's what's important. I think that's what we've been missing Oftentimes we talk about a lack of programming, a lack of funding, and it's not a malicious, a malicious action per se, it's just ignorance. And if what you know is commercial farming or big farming, and those are the problems that you understand, then those are the problems that you will start to address. 
but as we bring in other individuals that allows for more voices to be heard in the forefront, I think that that is what will result in um, making change and, and there being the ability for change to take place so that we can get more programs. And especially as we look at, um, you know, we talk about the 2050 challenge, I swear it's talked about to death, but it's still a real thing. You know, we have to feed people and for sure, the pandemic made us accelerate that thought process. We don't need to figure out feeding people in 2050. We need to figure out feeding people in 2020. I think that's a, I mean, that's a wonderful point. And I think highlights what we were getting at um, in our kind of previous comments from you all, which is potentially this uh, conflict between how we define food security and kind of the movement towards more food sovereignty and equitable access to the food, uh, you know, that is part of your culture or your heritage, not just the kind of quantity of whatever food is available to you. So I don't know, Louise, if you wanted to comment a little bit on that dichotomy, I know we talked about it a little in our opening session. Yeah, I think when we talk about food sovereignty, we it's like it's, it precludes food security to some extent. Well, when we say food sovereignty, it means that people have a right to decide over their food systems, how things work, that their voice should be included. But there has to be like a like a horizontal platform in a way that the system does not become so extracted that creates more vulnerability than there it is. And within uh, academia or, or food system research, when we do that distinction, it's just that when we talk about food sovereignty, we are taking all those other social, cultural components within the production of food and not only the quantity. For example, in, in Puerto Rico, we, we, we did talk about a lot of food security that Puerto Rico produces only 10 to 15% of the food that it consumes. And if we, with that food security paradigm, we just focus on producing, producing more, but then we disregard those other dynamics, not only in Puerto Rico, but also subject to the US. And we know that as a US territory, Puerto Rico doesn't have agency on many of the regulations that are imposed on it. So in Puerto Rico, when we talk about food, food sovereignty and food sovereignty movements, more a, a grassroots uh, component, people, what are saying is that we need to take into account those dynamics that happen beyond the farm. Yeah, thank you for putting a finer point on that for us. I wanted to ask, just knowing kind of the audience of our National Science Policy Symposium, largely our, our audience tends to be kind of young scientists and engineers with the kind of more of the science mind and not as much of the social science and even policy things that we've talked about today. But of course, everyone here is enthusiastic about policy and advancing equity through policy as scientists. And so I'm curious if kind of the panelists could reflect on how you think the role of scientists uh, or what it should look like in policy in terms of kind of the questions we've been talking about and the policy change that we've been talking about that we need to see and want to see. Um, how can scientists contribute to that, especially young and early career scientists? Well, I think that scientists must be at the table for certain. I think that when questions are asked and when policy is established, we need people to be informed. We know that some policy results as a reaction to emotion, but we must, there must be balance. There must be balance. And so we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly with regards to the establishments of policies um, for instance, there was a policy established that horses could not be slaughtered in the United States. And it, was, it came from a good place. However, it resulted in undernourished animals, animals being put on the wayside, animals being improperly transported out of the country for slaughter. And so there was a deleterious effect because of that policy. I think that it is very important that you have as much information as possible and scientists have to be a part of that conversation. What they think is not the end all and be all because we know that science is magical and it can change a little bit. 
but it's important and it's an important part of the conversation because ultimately so science is facts. And so you need that information to balance the emotion that might trigger the desire for policy initially. I totally second that and echo that 100%. Certainly one thing in here in Puerto Rico that we wanted to bring scientists to the table that was one of the motivators to create the Puerto Rico Science Policy Action Network. We know a lot of scientists and students doing great in generating important knowledge, but then that stayed within the constraints of academia. So as a student, I think we should find ways and leverage our networks and be part of different groups because, because we cannot do things alone to try and bring that knowledge to the different spaces where decisions are being made, where policies being made, and also bring that to the public discussions because not everybody have access to the knowledge that we have. And as students, if you do, to those in, the students in the audience, if you are doing research, publish research brief, opeds, be part of different groups that again, make things more accessible. Yeah, I definitely want to echo the, the idea of communication. I think, you know, as a student, one of the best things you can do is, you know, take a social science class, take a communications class, learn how to communicate, you know, whatever it is that you're learning to very broad audiences, because that's, you know, that's what's lacking within science, right? Oftentimes I feel like I exist in an academia bubble. Um, and it's just really about, you know, how can you share that knowledge and information to, to people? And I, and I think working, you know, currently with grassroots organizers, one of the things that I've really learned is that people have lost trust in policy or in academics and in, and in science. And I really think it's our, our job, our role to, to regain that trust and that, you know, that means communicating in, you know, ways that people can understand. It also means just, you know, being human sometimes and, and really interacting with people in a way that, you know, we can just exist together, right? We're all existing together. Um, and so I think just, you know, learning what Louis said, like writing op-eds, writing, you know, public facing documents, um, and also just learning, you know, what is it that communities need? Being able to ask those questions, I think are really important to, to gain trust and build those relationships to really be able to implement change. Yeah, I love the emphasis on asking questions and listening as, as scientists is something we all need to take to heart. So it's really communicating to a consumer versus a farmer versus a farm worker anywhere else in the food system are all different tasks. And so it's important for us to be prepared for that. One last um, kind of, I think a good question to bring us back and kind of summarize what we've been talking about, um, which is that of course, advancing sustainability in agriculture requires the adoption of new technologies across the board and across the food system. And so what, did, what best practices do you all have for things we can do to avoid historic trends of excluding minority groups from access to those new technologies that are so important in, in lowering the carbon footprint of the food system? But certainly being intentional about inclusion. Um, we talk a lot about diversity and I always tell people, I really kind of hate the word diversity. What I like is inclusion. Um, diversity really highlights our differences. Inclusion allows us to come together and bring our differences to make a difference. And so I think that, you know, we want to be mindful of places where passions are similar and aligned. When we talk about technology, who are the people, who are the groups that can benefit from this, who want to benefit from this and make certain that they're at the table. And so if we did that, then that would be inclusive and all of those voices would be there. And not later on, but at the start of the conversation, oftentimes what we see with minority groups you know, whatever is very important to me and the most of us, that's what we're gonna talk about. And we never stopped initially to consider on the front end, how can this benefit everyone else as well and bring them to the table at the start. And I think if we did that, then we would be a lot of further along in a lot of things that we're doing and we would have um, stronger policy as well. In terms of adopting new technologies or sustainable technologies that can improve 
uh, farm adaptation outcomes or other livelihood outcomes, I think it's important to deeply understand from the context of research, what are those drivers and barriers for adopting those practices? What are the trade-offs who have access to it? And I think that understanding, bringing that farmer voice in the case of farmers into that, that research platform and, and doing more like a participatory process in understanding why things are done, why are not, what helps, what doesn't help. I think it's, it's something that could move us forward. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Just being able to understand the cultural context in which technologies are being implemented is so important. And that might seem like, you know, we're focusing on Asian communities or like black communities, but really it's just understanding the culture of, you know, urban farmers, rural farmers, like large land owning farmers, right? Being able to understand what context that technology is being implemented, being able to ask those social questions of, okay, so, how are you going to be using this? Like, what practices are you using? Why are you doing that? Um, can really help lower this barrier of access to technology, implementation of that technology, and great continued resilience of that technology. And I just wanna say that it's important that um, organizations such as Manners, of course, are included in these discussions. So not just Manners, there are other organizations like Manners that are really passionate and serve as a conduit for these conversations. And so um, that's a great resource and there are others like it that should really be emphasized. Absolutely, thanks so much for highlighting that. And thank you all panelists and attendees for being with us and, and sharing your wonderful perspectives on this very large <laughs> and uh, wicked topic indeed. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, and I hope to see you all at the, the networking hours tonight. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.